Opinions stated in this podcast should not be used as evidence. Assume that any cited evidence can be found in the related Candor Briefs releases. Thank you, and welcome to Former Partners. Hello, and welcome back to the Former Partners Podcast. As always, I am Lucas. And I am Quentin. Always good to have you back. We've got a couple things we want to talk about before we dive in today. We will be talking about the India-United Nations Security Council topic on this episode. Let me pull up the actual resolution. It's a little bit different. I got into a, um, I got into a pretty normal stride with all the resolutions being worded pretty much the same the united states should Mm -hmm. but this one is resolved the united nations should grant india permanent membership on the security council Ooh, pretty good stuff i like it it's relevant it's kind of weird they would use should yeah for a legal status change essentially well we'll get into the background of it um because things are in motion. I think it's more of a, is this a good idea topic? Fair enough. Before we get into that, Candor Briefs, 2019-2020 um, subscriptions and packages are available now. If you use the website, um, candordebate.com, all the packages are available. If your school prefers to pay a different way, um, like by check or with a school account, that kind of thing, um, I will be sending out order forms with different options. If that's something you're interested in, email me at candordebateco at gmail.com um, and I can get that sent to you. I'm going to be sending out email blasts probably in the next week or so to get everybody ready for next season. And I can kind of give a non biased opinion on this topic or on this packet that you do, the candor briefs, because yeah. I don't really work on that project. Right. And, uh, in terms of the evidence that is available when you're talking about other packets versus candor briefs, in my opinion, there is a quantity over quality approach in a lot of releases. Yeah. They want to give you a whole bunch of content so that they can put that big price point on there. Quentin, I think, does a really good job finding <laughs> excuse me, relevant information. I don't think there's a single thing in his packet that you could call topicality on. And I also think he finds good cards. Like uh, if your average card is a three out of five and most releases, I'd say all of his sit around 4.5 out of five. I appreciate that. That's very sweet. Yeah. I mean, I'm not just trying to plug you because we work together on this. I'm mostly trying to plug you because I do think that Candor Briefs is a really solid product versus other similar projects. And I think it's a better price point. So, And you're the only one that has had like straight up first-hand experience with the evidence that I cut. Yeah, no, that's the thing is I was Quentin's debate partner for three years and he did the bulk of the research, like some 85%, I would say, of our overall research while we were partners was done for him. I was just kind of the sponge Yeah, and uh, it was always good stuff. I mean, we, we had a pretty successful career, I would say. So yeah, yeah if, that, if that's anything, if that's worth anything to any, you definitely pick up candor briefs this season it will give you a little bit of a competitive edge i think i can't say you'll win every round because of it but you'll do you'll do better yeah i think uh i like to think that i cut pretty good cards um another thing that i'm excited about is the recency ios app should be getting dropped next week um we ran into some issues with the app store wanting us to change a couple things around so we got that done we're putting the finishing touches on it in the next couple days going to submit it hopefully by Sunday. Um, So hopefully by the next episode of Former Partners, we will have information on how to download the app. I'm very excited about it. We we added timers that are pretty... um, They're really sleek. Yeah, and they're a lot different than than other timers. Um, I don't want to give too much away. If you want to see what I'm talking about, check the Twitter at Candor Briefs. I posted some sneak peeks at it. So... That's also, what I'm excited about. If you download that app, it's going to be really good for 
us because not only is it going to show that you guys are interested, but it's going to prove to our guy, Andrew, who I know is probably listening right now. What up, Andrew? What up, Andrew? We love you. It's going to prove to our guy, Andrew, so that he's not wasting his time with us, which I don't think he thinks he is, but it would probably make him feel pretty good. Yeah, if he, you was, guys he wasn't a debater. He's just a good friend and wanted to help out. So um, I think it'll, you know, if enough people use it. He also said if enough people use it, he will build a Mac desktop app for it which a lot of people have been asking for the beta testers have been so that's cool i'm excited about recently we have beta testers yeah that's amazing yeah um sadly it's only available for ios right now but we will once it gets some traction well it makes sense though because i feel like coding apps for the android os is a little more difficult because there's so many different platforms that that runs on yeah and andrew is just he he knows ios that makes sense So the last thing before we jump into the topic, um, I don't want to give too much away about this because I'm still up in the air about it. Um, I'm thinking about running a public forum camp this summer. It would be late July. Um, I'm not exactly sure how I'm wanting to do it yet. I know I want it to be virtual um, so that it's pretty affordable and pretty accessible to everybody. No travel. Um definitely less than a grand you know Mm -hmm. for everybody so what i'm going to do is i'm going to put a little survey in the description of this episode um it should transfer to whatever app you use if you're on youtube or if you use apple Podcasts, google Podcasts, spotify whatever um it should be in the details so click on that take my survey um about the public forum camp and let me know your thoughts on it so that's that's the last thing I had on the agenda to talk about before the topic. If there's a big response to the public forum camp, I might help out with that, guys. And I know how much you love me, so... Lucas doesn't know this, but I kind of already planned on having him help out on it anyway. I kind of figured so. as much when I saw the <laughs> uh, the potential schedule for it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was like, hey, that's two things at once. You can't be in two places at the same time, Quentin. Yep. Oh, wait, that means you'll have to have someone helping you. Yeah, I meant to talk to you about that. Let's talk about that later. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> All right. India and the United Nations Security Council. So just for some analysis and some background... We like to talk about the trigger for the topic. What what brought this topic into relevancy to be a public forum topic? It's definitely important because yeah. understanding the trigger can get you some of the most relevant information. Because right. there's going to be stuff on this topic all the way back to the 1950s. And we're oh, going to yeah. talk about it a little bit. But And that's one thing that I've noticed with the evidence while I'm making this brief is like there is good evidence from like 2006 that I'm cutting. Mm-hmm. You know, it's... There, it's been such a, a long thing that there's a lot of good um, arguments. Yeah, and the question is, it's less, you know, why should we do this? And it's, why should we do this right now? Right. Because it's been a possibility for so long. Yeah, so India has been wanting to be a permanent member on the UNSC, which is what we're going to call the United Nations Security Council, because that's way too much to say. On the UNSC, or at least change the system for the UNSC, like do a a reform of it um, for decades. But the actual trigger, how do you say his name? Uh, Joe Panaccio, I believe. Yeah, that's uh, Joe Panaccio. He's a senator. He introduced legislation um, to push the UN to make India a permanent member of the UNSC. And I think that's probably where the trigger comes from. Now, if you're not sure what the UNSC is, uh, the United Nations obviously is a global governmental body that it kind of exists as an agreement uh, between pretty much everybody. But what is it like North Korea and Saudi Arabia or Pakistan, something like that? No, Pakistan and Saudi Arabia. I don't know. There's like two countries that aren't in it. And North Korea is one of them. Yeah. and it's just uh it's where like the international Decla- declaration of human rights comes from it's where some of our war rules come from but yeah. the security council which is what we're talking about is the big 5 players yeah and the, the P5 the P5 yes and they are permanent members of yeah. essentially like the highest order they're kind of like the presidents of the united nations yeah um and they they make a lot of decisions on Because the United Nations is all about peace Mm -hmm. um, and 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 multilateral action. Right. And the Security Council are the guys that look at international conflict or even just in like within nations conflicts and decide 
what are the steps here because they're not solving it themselves. Um, but before we move into that, India, you know, they're not, they're not just some random country that wants a spot at the table. They've been a major player in international governance since it's since international governance was a thing. They were there for the Treaty of Versailles um, that eventually led to the League of Nations. That was the precursor to the UN. They were there for the creation of the United Nations. You know, they have always been like a founding, at least participant of these international governance systems. Yeah, and I know that a lot of the debate students that are listening to this probably don't get this world perspective anymore, but a lot of people see India as like a really far behind third world type place. Like they're, you know, they're eons behind the United States. They have a very rural lifestyle, but that's not really the case. I mean, they're one of the largest emerging economies in the world right now. They have the second largest population in the world. Of any nation, yeah. Yeah, they have, I think they have like the largest amount of uh, computer development, essentially with IBM and Google. They're making so much tech tech there they just produce computers like wild so this isn't um if you're having like a kind of a perception issue here like why would india want to be you know on a council with the united states like what do they have to bring to the table there isn't a perception issue that they are they are fairly modern they have a lot of resources they have a lot of power they have a lot of people yeah i mean whenever you think india um i think it it is easy to see a stereotype Mm -hmm. um of some kind but that's really not not accurate anymore definitely not um so yeah it is i mean it is definitely relevant it's a good thing to argue about um it's it's important so in the status quo the p5 the permanent five is what they call the five permanent members of the security council and we'll get into the non-permanent members in a second but the p5 were the allied powers the winners of world war ii It was the United States, the United Kingdom, Russia, China, and France. Um, That's how it's always been since the creation of the United Nations and the Security Council. Why isn't Canada on the council? I don't know. That's a weird one. I actually don't know enough about that history to... Because there were more than just those five in the Allied Powers. Yeah, but were they... They were kind of like the main... Like, they were the biggins. I don't know. Canada really did a lot of work in really? England. Yeah. I don't know. They could have turned it down for all I know. Canada always That's true. Kinda... That's true. They do kind of, they, they kind of float between the United States and Switzerland in terms yeah. of how they, they just handle their s- foreign affairs. They just sit back and um, like half neutral. Yeah. And that could be a perception thing too. We could be totally wrong about that, but that's how I see it. That is true. Now, the only difference between the permanent members and the non-permanent members is one, obviously they're permanent. They mm-hmm. hold those seats forever. It's not terms, that's just, they are always there. But they also have veto power. Now, in general, like we were talking about, the Security Council looks at conflict and makes decisions on it. That veto power means that even if every other country on the Security Council, permanent or non-permanent, decides on one plan of action, if one of those permanent members vetoes, that's it. It's not happening. Um, It makes sense, though. Sometimes, yeah. It's, I mean, sometimes, but it also makes sense in terms of because you're talking about five hegemonic superpowers, right? That are all nuclear actors. They're all leads of some form of industry because yeah. it's keeping them on the council. Yeah. So you don't want to take one of those guys off, you know, and you don't want to do something that's going to undermine Russia or China or France or the U.S. directly because it's gonna you're gonna pay for it. Right. So. One thing, though, is like with this veto power, one of the concerns with it is like, for example, with uh, with Russia and the Ukraine. um, What what was that? Where were they? No, I remember that. That was uh, the Crimea. Yeah. Yeah. The Crimea zone of Russia when they just went in and took it. Yeah. Russia (laughs) like spammed their veto power to stop any intervention there. Yeah. No. And that that's different when one of the uh, the Security Council members starts behaving in a way that's typically imperialist yeah. and uh, is not conducive <laughs> to multilateral politics, I, I think that there probably is some questions about permanent veto power that yeah. need to come up. And that that will actually come up later in the podcast. Cool. Um, it's a really good point. Now, on the other side of the coin, 
from the permanent members, there are non-permanent members. Um, at first, it was five non-permanent members, but that was expanded to ten non-permanent members back in 1965. So the way it works is these ten members, they have two-year terms starting on January 1st. Five of them switch off every year. So there's never an entire new non-permanent member council. Five stay, five switch, and then those other five switch, etc., etc. To get elected, you're elected by the United Nations General Assembly. So close to 200 countries have to vote. Um, and you have to receive at least two-thirds of all votes to be elected. Um, it's kind of It's a pretty big deal to be a non-permanent member. Um, now, whenever we look at India as a non-permanent member in the past, they've been a non-permanent member on the Security Council seven times. Um, most recently in 2011 and 2012, which that was like a like close to a 30-year gap. Hmm. Before 2011 and 2012 term, the last time they were on was like the 80s, I think. So they have a total of 14 years as non-permanent as a non-permanent member seat. Um, and are tied with Colombia and Pakistan for the fourth most time served, just behind Japan, Brazil, and Argentina. So they've got a pretty good case for being a, a member of the Security Council, knowing how it works. Um, it's not like they're inexperienced in this area. It's kind of weird, though, that they're of their 14-year tenure, only two of them have occurred within the last 30 years. Yeah. And... Uh... It makes me wonder, you know, amongst Japan, Brazil, and Argentina, how much of their tenure has happened in the last 10 years even. Right. There was a, a huge, um, like, India went up for a non-permanent seat in, like, the 90s, I think. And they pretty much competed directly with Japan. Mm. And India just got blown out. Like, like, nobody voted for India over Japan. Is that when India and Japan started kind of working together behind the scenes? Yeah. Yeah, okay. sort of. That makes um, sense. Which is interesting because whenever we're looking at support for India as a permanent member, because this is, like we said, this has been a long time coming, um, all five permanent members unofficially support India. Like, the US, the UK, Russia, and France have all said, yes, India would be a good permanent seat member. China, though, just recently said... Yeah, we're okay with that as long as they denounce their support for Japan. Hmm. So it's interesting that you bring Japan up because, yeah, they, you know, they clashed for that non permanent seat and then started working together, but now they may have to split up if India wants a permanent seat, at least in China's eyes. If you don't know why China and Japan hate each other so much, um, I want you to imagine the Holocaust, except it's one country directly to one other country and it's more people dead and that's what japan did to china at one point in time in the last like 250 to 300 years yeah not not a good relationship there yeah like for being super close to each other like they killed like 40 million chinese or something <laughs> yeah it was just japanese killed 40 million chinese it's not even like all of the intricacies of world war ii where you can chalk up you know seven million deaths to the nazis and all of one million to right. so and so it's like no japan directly responsible for 40 million some odd chinese deaths really yeah i didn't know that i need to look it up really quick to make yeah, sure i'm not misspeaking so but i seem to remember this i think it was during mao or something like oh, that that would make sense did a quick fact check. Wasn't 40 million. Japan during World War II killed like some 10 million people. And of that 10 million, like 6 million were Chinese. But still, just unprecedented direct one country to another country slaughter. Yeah. Um, one of the instances, Nanking slaughter, happened over the course of like two weeks. They killed like 300,000 people, uh, raped like 30,000 women. Real bad stuff. Yeah. So there's there's a really bloody history there, and that's why between Japan and China. Yeah, that's why even in the modern day, you can understand why Japanese politicians would be hesitant to give, uh, or excuse me, Chinese politicians. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Uh, would be hesitant to give India a seat on the UNSC if they still support Japan. Right. If if their partnerships, um, because China is pretty. I don't want to say China is. Um, 
set back in their ways, old timey or anything, but they they view that kind of thing very seriously. Well, and plus we still don't. I mean, the United States still doesn't allow Japan to have a an official armed military forces, right? Because of Pearl Harbor, and, yeah. and World War II in general. Exactly. Yeah. Like we still step in, and what is it like Article Two in their Constitution or yeah, something, something like, like that. that? We are their military essentially, yeah. because we don't support them having one because of what they did. Yeah. Yep. So that's where that comes from. Um, which also will come up later. A lot of this, a lot of this topic, arguments, um, reach into each other. This is so exciting. I love World War II topics. I, I just I like international topics a lot. That's true. That's also fun. On on one hand, it sucks because whenever it's a topic about the United States, it's so easy to impact out to the judge, as this affects you directly because taxes or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, so this doesn't have that necessarily, but. It is a it is a cool topic. It does suck though, because it also has a handful of shaded perceptions of yeah. the countries that you're talking about. Yeah. So yeah, so let's talk about specific sides. Let's go to pro first and just look at India's case for being a permanent seat. Okay. Um, there's about five or six things here. First is peacekeeping, and um, the United Nations. You know they are a, a peaceful organization. Whenever they see conflict, they don't employ military necessarily as um, militaristic uh, occupation. They employ peacekeepers that are just sort of mediators, um, which we had a peacekeeping topic, which was probably my favorite topic in high school. Do you remember that topic? Mm -hmm. That the United Nations peacekeepers should be able to employ force or whatever it was. Yeah, I remember. That was a fun topic. But peacekeepers, um, yeah, they're just, they are the military for the UN, if you can even call them military, because they aren't allowed to engage unless they have super specific engagement policies. Pretty much unless they're defending a VIP and like they're actively under fire, they can't fight back. Right. They have to just pe keep the peace. Yeah. You know, do their very best to evacuate civilians, take cover yeah. and clean up afterwards. So peacekeeping missions are a very crucial part of the Security Council and United Nations in general. Um, India has supplied over 160,000 troops for peacekeeping missions, which is more th almost double the permanent five members contributions combined. Like take all the peacekeeping troops that the United States, UK, Russia, China, and France have given double it. And India is almost more than that. Wow. Yeah. Um, 43 countries they've done missions in, um, which is the most of any country. Um, India is number one in supplying peacekeepers and almost 200 Indian troops have died on peacekeeping missions. So big RIP to them. Um, so that's, that's one of their points. They say we have been hugely supportive of peacekeeping missions, which are crucial to the United Nations Security Council. Mm -hmm. Um, that gives us a good, a good spot, you know, the next thing would be the economy. Like Lucas was talking about. Um, and United Nations donations um, to their contributions to keep it running. Um, India has a, a very quickly growing economy, um, one of the fastest right yeah. now. Yeah, I mean, you can put, you can basically put the Chinese and American economies at an equal playing field right now because they are about the same GDP. Like it's it's less than a couple million difference yeah. or something. And India is not that far behind one yeah. of those types of situations. But India, even through like Brexit and all these weird tariffs and trade deals, they've been growing at like a 7% growth rate. Well, yeah, they have all their, they have everything they need inside yeah. of their own borders. They're such a large area and they have so many people and so They're many resources. self-sustaining, but they also have a lot to give. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And they've decided to give yeah. rather than sit on and stock up. Yeah. So they're, so they're growing economically, which, um, is a pretty good indicator of um, hegemony and and power mm -hmm. um, in a region in, in the world. This leads into geopolitical change. Um, India views themselves as having new ideas and outlooks on issues facing the world. They also think it's strange that considering their e economic growth and their demographics um, being the second largest population in the world and their contributions to peacekeeping etc they think that this change in the geopolitical spectrum 
makes it unfair that they don't have a spot at the table. Well, and it's really interesting because they would be the only country that's even remotely able to be considered Middle Eastern yeah. that is on the council. And that's still yeah. kind of iffy if India is really in the Middle East. Right. But, it's, it depends on who you ask, really. Yeah. But still, like, that is a good point that that region of the world is highly unrepresented on the yeah. Security Council. Yeah. You have an Asian power and two European powers, three European powers. Yeah. And an American power. Yeah, you pretty you pretty much have China and then four Western mm. powers. You know, yeah, depends on how you count Russia, but yeah, it's there's a there's a lot there of Western power with Eastern ideology. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, uh, there there's the Security Council is lacking a lot of representation in these areas, which is one point India has. The next thing they talk about is alignment, um, like we talked about earlier throughout history. India has displayed a, a very good um, a state of constructiveness um, and democracy, especially whenever they were non-permanent members on the Security Council. What do you mean by constructiveness? So whenever votes come up, um, they typically are on the right side of things with everybody else. Okay, so they haven't been voting against peacekeeping missions right. for places They're, like Rwanda. Right. They're not they're not letting their ideals come into play and getting getting in the way of the ideals of the Security Council. I feel like that's really big for a country that has as many domestic what's the word? Equality issues yeah. as India has. Yeah. That um, they're able to kinda that at the very least they have some people who don't have those ideologies in power for the United Nations seats. Yeah. And it's l just looking at the votes that they've had um it's something like 60 percent of their votes whenever they vote for something it's been a unanimous vote everybody agreed but like whenever they they pretty much are always in line with everybody hmm. they never like sit out of a vote alone like they're never the weird odd man out they're never the the um oh who is it that always votes against everything like mozambique I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> There's somebody who like has literally voted no on almost every single UN resolution. Really? Yeah. <laughs> they should be on the Security Council. <laughs> don't you think? Uh, Are you looking it up? Yeah. Probably Mozambique. I say that, but I have no idea. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm not going to be able to find this very quickly because what I'll have to do is I'll have to look up a record of UN votes and then I'll just have to go through and kind of thumb and look because there's not like a, a meta-analysis of yeah. every UN vote ever, unfortunately. We get the joke, though. Yeah. Yeah, it was funny. Thanks. Yeah. No, they're not like that. They typically are in line with everybody. I'll see myself out, though. Yeah, no problem. See you later. I'll just finish this. Yeah, have fun. Yeah, um, yeah they're pretty aligned with... Don't act. Stop. Sit down. They're typically pretty aligned with everybody, especially whenever we're talking about the Security Council votes. Um, so alignment is important um, because we don't we don't want somebody on the Security Council that's just going to try to change everything and and abuse their new permanent seat. Wow, I never would have pegged you as a traditionalist. Shut up. Fight me. Fight me right now. You know what I mean. Yeah, I mean, I know what you mean. You, you don't want five democracies and a monarchy on the security council together because then they're just probably going to disagree because fundamentally they're different right and what you're saying is that their vote record has indicated that they do have a similar rationale yes, as exactly. other members of exactly. the security council exactly. I, I i know where you're at i'm just playing a little bit of devil's advocate i'm not a traditionalist i know i like change anyway <laughs> one of the last points for India is their historical impact. Like we talked about, India was a founding member or a participant in the 1919 Paris Peace Conference, the League of Nations, uh, the United Nations in 40, 1945, the General Agreement on Tariff and Trade in 1947, the World Trade Organization in 95, etc., etc., etc. They have, they themselves have been part of the foundation of everything we know um, for international governance, which I think gives them a pretty good track record for 
being important and and contributing to to this this international governance system. Do you agree on that? I'll allow it. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> and lastly, support, like we talked about. India has the support of becoming a permanent member um, by the US, the UK, Russia, France, and now sort of China, as long as they denounce their support of Japan. So that's not really an issue there. All right, that all sounds great and good, but like they've been contributing since day one, like you said, yeah. since before the United Nations even to the idea of world government yeah. and all of these things. If that has been the case for so long and they've been this huge supporting force for peacekeeping missions and all of this, why haven't they been added already? What's been the uh, the hang up for keeping them out thus far? Well, actually, it's interesting. They have been offered a permanent seat a couple times. They turned it down? Yeah. Why? Um, so the first time... Oh, man, I have the card. Because for me, the, it, this is less of a topic of why should we do this, and it's more of a topic of why should we do this now? Right. If the evidence is showing us, for the most part, that this has been like everyone's kind of opinion the whole time. Yeah. Um. So, right. So the first time um, India's prime minister, and this is Dabade 2017, um, India's first prime minister shied away from the highly debatable offer to join the Security Council by both the superpowers, the U.S., and then the Soviet Union in 1950 and in 1955, respectively. Um, they steadfastly refused to join at the expense of China. The prime minister, Nehru, wrote... India, because of many factors, is certainly entitled to a permanent seat in the Security Council, but we are not going in at the cost of China. So they essentially said China deserves our seat? Right. That's, I mean, that's a point in their favor, really. Yeah. Yeah. Like they. That's, that shows great maturity as a country, if your understanding of how you fit into geopolitical politics. Yeah. And not only or once, geopolitical situations. Not only once, but twice. Right. Like they, they want in, but they understand that it's a big change. Mm hmm. Um, and they're not willing to ruin everything to do. Well, and probably a good move on not getting in the UN Security Council in the middle of the Cold War. Yeah, exactly. I bet Russia was like, yeah, we'd love to put some missiles in your country, just like we did Turkey. Yeah, I mean... Or I guess we did that. United States did that in Turkey, and Russia did it in Cuba. The, the US was like, hey, we're in the middle of this huge thing. You want to join and be a vote in our favor? And they were like, no. And then Soviet Union was like, hey, we're in this huge thing with the U.S. You want to join and be a vote in our favor? And they were still like, no. Let's talk about this in 50 years. You know? <laughs> That's fair. But nonetheless, there has to be a case against yeah. why they shouldn't join. There has to be some other reasons. Oh, there because is. Because I'm sure there's other times where there hasn't been a major world war or cold war or something going on where, you know, they could have joined, but they there was another reason they didn't. Yeah, so, so moving over to Khan and the case against India, um, the first thing, we talked about alignment, at least in voting. They do have a history of non-alignment with important things. So first, India did not become a party to the Human Rights Rome Statute, even though they were part of the development of it. They were there discussing it. They decided not to join the Human Rights Statute of International Governance. Um, they did not sign the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. I think them not joining the Rome Statute kind of ties back to what I was talking about earlier with, with their, some of the equality issues yeah. they have within their own borders. Yeah, they do have domestic equality issues. Yeah, for sure. Definitely. Um, they didn't sign the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty and are continuously developing their nuclear power against the, the general consensus. <laughs> Man, that's a hard one because it's like there's a, there's... By, uh, seven nuclear actors in the world, something like that, seven or nine, I don't remember exactly how many, but there's there's a very small elite group of nuclear actors in Five the world. Five of them are the permanent members of the P5. Yes. And of those members, essentially all of them are saying, hey, everybody else, don't get this thing that gives you the largest bargaining chip you could possibly have yeah. for international politics. Right, which is understandable because only it is us, so... Only we can have it. Yeah. Nobody else can have it. We're going to say everybody do non-proliferation, but we're not actually going to disarm our arsenal either. So we're always just going to be a step above you. So I understand yeah. maybe why they'd want to get to like a baseline level where they're equal with everybody yeah. else. And that was India's reasoning. They said um, something along the lines of, we're not signing this because we disagree with disarmament. We're not signing it because we think this is like 
this isn't fair. Yeah, this is an attempt to keep non-nuclear actors suppressed yeah. by nuclear actors. Yeah, and actually, whenever we're talking about nuclear weapon states, um, India, in like 2005 and 2008, actually signed agreements with the U.S., and everybody's just good now. Mm -hmm. Like, India was on the brink of becoming like a pariah for disagreeing with the NPT and developing, but now they're sort of a, like de facto nuclear weapon state along with the other permanent members because of the agreements. Okay. But so they just, were probably like, you guys can come in and inspect our facilities yeah, they've been and cool about it. we'll they, show you that we're not trying to blow you up. Right. We're just trying to we're not sharing. We're just doing our own thing. They're trying to bite into 20th century, mutually assured destruction. Yeah, right. Exactly. <laughs> um, so that one, I'm sure there's going to be some clash on nuclear power, but in the case against India, general non-alignment. Um, they didn't sign the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. Fair enough. Um, they are also highly skeptical of the responsibility to protect, which is the crucial third pillar that the UN kind of goes off of. It's kind of bad, considering that they're the uh, largest contributor of peacekeepers. Exactly. And and it's messy because they totally agree with the the whole setup of responsibility to protect. What is the responsibility to protect? Essentially, they decided whenever they were making the Security Council and making the United Nations and deciding when to intervene, um, the responsibility to protect is if a country is not doing their part to protect their citizens, these higher members do it for them and intervene. So they're not, they're, they're kind of like anti world police. Yes, India is very pro autonomy. That's weird for somebody who wants to be on the security exactly, council. <laughs> exactly. They, that's one major thing that like the responsibility to protect is a huge thing for the security council and India is iffy on it. They completely disagreed with it when it first got it started being discussed. Um, they're changing their views on it a little bit, but they're still not, not into intervention. Interesting. Yeah. So they have some issues with non-alignment. In, in pretty important areas. Um, so that's a, that's part of the case against India. I'm talking specifically about India's actions. Can we can we circle back to that really quick? Yeah. Okay. I think that the Rome statute, especially, and the responsibility to protect are both great ones for you to pull on on the con side yeah. because of the inclusion of the word should yes. in the resolution. Yes. And if you're looking at this resolution through a moral scope... And you're showing that a lot of the purpose of the United Nations is to try to help establish a basic ethical code for governments, especially in times of war, how they're going to interact with each other with peacekeeping operations. If they're not agreeing with those mm -hmm. basic ethical concepts, that really bites into the questions of should, like, is this yes. morally right for us to be pushing for that? And you yep. could definitely say no, because they're not buying into it the right way. Yeah, I think especially responsibility to protect. Yeah, that's Just huge because that, that is crucial too. Because there's only three pillars. Yeah. Uh, for the UN peacekeeping. Yeah. So that means they're they're disagreeing with one third of the idea of it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, which yeah, is at its core disagreement with the basics of Security Council. Um, was that what? Yeah, that was all I wanted to say. I okay. Just try to tie that back into the yeah. resolution wording yeah. and how those those three instances, uh, nuclear non-proliferation, Rome statute, and responsibility to protect, all three would be great moral arguments to make on the con right. that, hey, India is not doing ethically the things that they should be doing. And since today we're talking about if we should allow yeah. them, like we shouldn't because they're not doing what they're supposed to. Right, right. What about uh, in points against India, what about the whole uh, Jammu and Kash Kashmir um, so, yeah, so the JNK is typically what it's called, um, Jammu and Kashmir. This is India acting specifically in international law. Now, Jammu and, Kash Jammu, Jammu and Kashmir, or the IOK, because it's Indian-occupied Kashmir, um, it's a very, very long history. Is this Pakistan? Yeah, it's India and Pakistan. Oh, boy. So this was like... This was right after the development of the UN. This was one of the first major international conflicts actually brought to the UN um, for solving. So Pakistan and India have been arguing over this area that they both border since like the 40s and 50s. Um, 
what it is is whenever India split up and Pakistan became its own nation, there was this area between them called the JNK that they both are thinking is theirs. Oh, so it's a Damascus situation. Right. Okay. So what it is is like they both think it's theirs. Um, the citizens view themselves as most likely wanting to be Pakistani. But way back in the 50s, they had a leader that was aligned. Sympathetic to the Indian cause. Right. Yeah. They aligned with Indian ideals. So that single leader signed an intent, um, like a pledge to be to become part of India, even though that's not what the majority of the citizens wanted. Mm. Nothing officially ever happened. Um, it became a standoff. Pakistan and India both occupying this area and sort of just staring each other down. Like a North Korea, South Korea border right. situation for years they both refused to pull out when it went to the united nations every time they said both you guys leave and we will pull like the jnk citizens mm -hmm. and they will decide where they go pakistan said how do we know that india is going to leave if we do india said the same thing neither of them left and now it's just a war zone mm. um so a lot of people argue that India is actually breaking multiple international laws and human rights statutes by occupying and almost doing their own apartheid there. They should just put a big line of tape down the middle. Yeah, just split it evenly. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Nobody's allowed to cross this line. <laughs> yeah, I wish that worked. And that's where a lot of the anti-India sentiment is coming from, from Pakistan. Because Pakistan is a huge anti-India joining the Security Council. Um, they're, they're the ones that are totally against it. So... In 1962, it went to the United Nations again. Um, the Soviet Union, then an ally of India, vetoed the resolution. Um, so this makes a lot of people question, one, is India a good person to join the Security Council when they have this history of occupation, you know? Yeah, but Russia's on the Security Council, and they did that with Crimea. Right. But Russia's a shoe-in. They kind of got grandfathered in. Russia was a member before that. It's just like, if we're going to penalize India for using their excessive resources to take advantage of weaker countries and to take zones that are kind of you know up you know up in the air, then we probably need to do the same thing to other UN Security Council members. Right, but the question is, you know, if like Russia, for example, in Crimea, mm -hmm. if Russia wasn't a permanent member already. And now they want it to become a permanent seat after the Crimea situation. Would we let them, considering the Crimea situation? Well, it sounds like it doesn't matter if India is going to be a member or not. They're still going to kind of get their way because they were able to influence the Soviet Union at the time and right get a veto. Time. Yeah. And I mean, if they could still, and they can probably do the same thing because of their partnerships nowadays. I, I doubt that it's hard for them to get one Security Council member to veto something. Yeah. Um. Yeah. I mean, that's that's part of the argument too. It also makes people question if India, if they were a permanent member, would they use that veto power to turn that situation in their favor, similar to what we were talking about with Russia vetoing every Crimea resolution? Would they abuse the veto? I feel like they're already abusing the veto through, I mean, their, their answer to not getting on the Security Council as early as they wanted to was just to become such an integral member of the right. United Nations that they were basically on the yeah. Security Council. Yeah. Yeah, that is true. They made good partnerships and got people to do the work for them. Yeah. Um, so that's that's, a, that's a good point, though. It definitely is yeah. a good point to raise that they're acting sort of imperialist and oh, yeah. that they're going to be using potentially their Security Council powers for things that wouldn't be cohesive to right. the uh, geopolitical right. climate. They would just be a superpower just bullying um, the IOK and the JNK and saying screw off Pakistan like we're powerful we're on the security council you're not like what are you going to do they're going to cut 60% of the world's oil trade <laughs> <laughs> uh, maybe <laughs> so that's pretty specific to uh, to India's actions and that really leads back to should the morality of it mm -hmm. um, are they going to act morally as a permanent member whenever they have this history of immoral activity. Yeah, because if you can prove that there is either even the potential for abuse 
of that power, that could probably be enough to get you a con ballot. Yeah. Let alone if you could actually show that they've used the power they already have to influence in the past. Yeah, and I'm sure you could almost turn this to to international war. Um, if India is a, is added as a permanent member, war breaks out because war is already breaking out. Pulwama, like three days ago, like 40 Indian troops were killed in a terrorist attack by the Pakistanis in Kashmir because of this. So imagine what happens whenever we give India a permanent seat and, and permanent world power. Scary. Big stuff. Moving a little bit more generic, um, a little bit more just general ideas. Um, another part of the case against India is just generally expansion being bad. A lot of people, including the P5, argue that expanding the permanent five members will dilute the power of those permanent members. Um, as it is, they've been doing it the same way for as long as it's existed. And adding somebody changes the entire dynamic of everything. Mm -hmm. Will it dilute the power is the idea. Because right now it's set up where these five members are the five members because they prove themselves um, sort of during World War II as being on the right side of the war and winning. Is it, is it worth changing everything? Devil you know versus devil you don't, you know? Yeah. By adding India. Um, and there's a lot of evidence about there about, about expanding Security Council. I see that argument. I just also see it as kind of weak because that's, that's just... Uh... That's just going up in front of the judge and being like, change is scary. Don't vote for it. Yeah. You know, well, I, there's evidence to support it. There's evidence about Yeah, you just have to couple that yeah. with the non-alignment or the J and K example yeah. or something like that. You can't just go up there though and be like, ah, this could change everything, so we right. shouldn't do it. Right. Well, imagine like if I don't know, uh, some an analogy like We started having two presidents. That's ex how did you know? What the what? How did you know? We were we've known each other for like seven wow. years. Wow. My heart is beating so fast. That was crazy. It's a good. It's a good comparison because you are totally. Uh, it's not a great comparison because there's already a council in the United Nations, so it wouldn't be dramatically different. They'd right. just have one more veto voice to deal with. Yeah, but it would be uh, a decent comparison to say it would be like having two presidents because then you'd have two people that need to try to work together and that have the same power as the other. Yeah. Imagine having six presidents. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I get that. So that's, that's the idea. Wow. That's crazy. Behind expansion being bad. Now the next thing, um, I love alternatives on con. One of the alternatives is other countries becoming permanent members. Some of these ideas or possible countries are Japan, Germany, Argentina, or Brazil. Remember those three that are, that have had more time, on the permanent, uh, as a non-permanent seat, um, above India and of course, Germany, um, they have just as much support in the United Nations, um, except Japan, you know, that one's a little iffy, like we talked about. Is alternatives good to run on this topic? I think because to me, there's nothing in the resolution or even in the situation as it's given that tells us that for one we couldn't add multiple new permanent seats and that for two there's an urgency to even add a seat in the first place well i think that a lot of the impacts of pro are going to come out to just reform yeah but I, I maybe i didn't explain that the way i was trying to do we even need a sixth security council member at all right it, is another way to look at the resolution not necessarily if it's india if it's anybody right and if you can't even answer that question with a yes i don't know if you can effectively argue alternatives uh, all i'm saying is if you want to run alternatives on a topic like this uh you should probably try to find something about the urgency of maybe having another actor yeah on the security council yeah. and maybe something also about how we shouldn't add more than one member yeah. to the security council um i don't i don't think pro can argue for more than one I think they could, I don't think that they couldn't though. Is what I'm saying is like, if you show this alternative, I think they could permit pretty easily say like, that's great. We're talking about, should we offer India? So yeah, we should offer India. And if you think that they're a good member too, we'll go ahead and say that they should also be a member. Right. I, I just think that, you know, if you can argue for reform, mm -hmm. having the huge impacts, um, 
and the expanding to one extra seat is the only option. Um, like you were talking about finding evidence that it should just be one permanent seat. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that alternatives are viable. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. To at least answer, like, a lot of the pro impacts are going to be if we add India, this reform happens and this happens. You say, well, India has this history of being bad. What about one of these other countries with more? Do you have anything in the brief that could be indicative of urgency for a new member and or that could outline that we only need one more member rather than two or three or four? I have... Evidence of reform. Okay. Um, former UN Secretary General Kofi Annan, RIP. He died like not too long ago, and I'm real sad about it because mm. he was dope. Good guy. But yeah, he advocated for Security Council expansion. Um, Dabad, Dabad. I don't know how to say that last name. Where? Right here. Oh. Dabad. Something. It's an Indian name. Dabad 2017. Um, A former UN Security General Kofi Annan said that the Security Council must either reform or risk becoming increasingly irrelevant. If we don't change the Council, we risk a situation where the primacy of the Council may be challenged by some of the new emerging countries. Okay, so that can indicate an urgency for a change. Yeah. So at the very least, you can use that to show that today's topic is necessary on the pro. Yeah, there is urgency. Yeah, because without urgency, I don't see why we should add any members yeah. to the United Nations Security Council. Because like you said before, it's a it's a it's a big scary change. It's worked this way the whole time. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's really easy to look at it if it's a don't if it's not broke, don't fix it yeah. type situation. Right. Um along with that though, with those other country alternatives, I think the idea comes from these other countries have more experience and are also more aligned with the views of the There's like a better track record. Right. Yeah. Um, I'm not saying you should run alternatives, but there are other options in other countries that have support and want to do the same thing. So that's where that idea comes from. Now, the last alternative, this is something I really like, is diluting the veto, which I think really would solve a lot of issues with support. This alternative is interesting because it's identifying the purpose of the resolution and offering an alternative solution rather than uh, just negating the resolution. Yeah. So France, one of the permanent five members, has voiced their support for waiving the veto power of the permanent members in certain cases to give all members, uh, permanent or not, the same voice. So just having like an actual democratic vote, one country, one vote. Right. So for example, in Crimea, if they had all decided a solution and Russia vetoed it, say, no, you can't do that. This is what we're doing. Mm -hmm. That would solve a lot of issues. Well, yeah, because, oh man, that's wild. Yeah. I'm just thinking about the implications of something like this. Yes. It's a really, it's cool for one. I like the, the uniqueness of it. I think you still have to indicate that India is not a good fit for the security council. Yeah. And you still have to indicate that there's an urgency for change within the United Nations. Right. If you're going to run an alternative still. Um, And, you know, it it doesn't directly take out the argument of, like, geopolitical change. Mm -hmm. But it sort of does if the geopolitical actors are represented by non-permanent members. And this gives non-permanent members more of a voice. But it's also like, how do you decide when, um, when to waive veto power? And do the does the P five have a veto on when we get to waive veto power? <laughs> right. That yeah. So let me see if I can find the card. Um, this is the full card. Border at all? Yeah, because I, I remember reading that that Russia yeah Russia vetoed it like many times, ten occasions. Yeah. Um, on the whole Crimea situation. Yeah. Um. Okay, yeah, Borger et al. 2015, France and others argue an immediate fix would be for permanent members to waive their veto rights in cases of mass atrocities. So, whenever there is a large human rights issue. So, yeah, but again, this is right there. It basically says that because one of the P5 members is vetoing that idea, they're vetoing the right to waive the veto. Right. Yeah, so until at least one time, you know, that happens, it's not going to happen. Yeah. Which, I mean, I guess that's how anything works, but... Yeah, so... You're not gonna... Until the precedent is finally set via twisting arms and stuff in the back room, 
no country is actually going to get on board with that veto thing. Yeah. I still think it's very interesting though. I think it's a, it's a cool alternative to talk about, um, that creates solvency and maybe different impacts, um, that don't bring India into the equation. I wish this topic was more about nukes. It can be. I like talking about nukes. Nukes. Your, your Oppenheimer, Oppenheimer quote. Just nukes in general. They're yeah. horrifying. There's so much to talk about with them. They're so interesting. Yeah. Like, uh, what was it? Operation Starfish? I don't know. When, uh, in the 60s, the United States federal government tried to ignite the atmosphere by detonating oh, nuclear yeah. bombs in high altitudes. Literally kill everybody. Yeah, just to see if it would work. Good stuff. Good idea. <laughs> Jeez. So, yeah, that's India and the United Nations Security Council. That's the case for, the case against, some background. Let us know if you have any questions. Um, just a quick recap on the stuff we talked about at the beginning. The recency app will be out next week. Um, you can order the Candor Briefs packages now. Email me at candordebateco at gmail.com. Hit me up on Twitter at Candor Briefs, etc., etc. If you want to buy them online, that's candordebate.com. They're all available if you have any questions. You know where to find us. Um, what was that guy's name who passed away? Kofi Annan? Yeah. Do oh, you, it, it was like late 2018. Do you want to do promo code Kofi for today? Oh, yeah. I almost forgot about promo code. Yeah. yeah. Promo code Kofi uh, whenever the brief for this topic comes out. How's uh, it spelled? K-O-F-I. Okay. Yep. Promo code Kofi for $5 off the brief. That's a, that's a big rest in peace to... Big R.I.P. A former, very important man in keeping the peace in the world. Yeah, he was one of the best um, best heads of the U.N. we've had. He was the only one that was, like, elected by the Security Council and General Assembly. Nice. Yeah. So, yeah. Sad day. Yeah, promo code Kofi um, in remembrance. I mean, it was, like, August of last year, I think. It's, I mean, I didn't know about it until right now, yeah. so. But, yeah. So promo code Kofi for five dollars off the brief whenever it comes out. Um, follow us on Twitter at Former Partners. And Answer the survey below yes, about the, in the description online public forum camp if you're interested. Yep, there's going to be some questions about have you ever been to a camp, how much did it cost, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, just so I can get some information on. Probably a question about if you ever wanted to go to a camp but you didn't. What was the biggest reason why? Right, right. Um, so yeah, make sure to do that if you are interested in the public forum virtual camp um, i'm very excited about it i hope i can do something with it so i don't have anything else do you i do not believe so uh this has been the former partners podcast as always i'm lucas and i'm quentin thank you enjoy and good luck <laughs>